the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So wrote St. John, the theologian, at the end of his gospel. I've always been very taken by his certainty. We know that his testimony is true. And why do we know this? Well, some people don't know. Even people that are Christians don't necessarily know. Because the way we know that his testimony is true is if we live according to that testimony. And he lived according to it, so he knew it was true. This is the way Christians should be about things. The world is, has all these things that they talk about and they, they have all this reasoning that they do and all this insane kind of posturing. We are Christians. We know what is true. We know what is true because we live what is true. And if you're not sure about what's true, that means you're not living what is true. I want to talk to you about the epistle especially that was written by St. John. And we read this portion of the epistle on his day. We're celebrating St. John the theologian today. The apostle of love. And he writes more than anyone else about love. And there's the key to knowing that things are true if you love if we love, then we are like God, since God is love. The whole point of your life is to love. Because if you love, you become like God. And that's the whole purpose of your life. Everyone knows I talk about that all the time. That's the critical piece of information that we should know. Not in our heads, but in our hearts. That everything should motivate us. That, that, that knowledge should motivate us to do everything. To love. Now, I just recently heard uh, a, a um, talk about uh, the mind of the church, Fronima. And I was thinking as I was hearing that talk, that's all I talk about. That's all I talk about. Every single sermon, every catechesis session, I wish I was a little more, hey baby. I wish I was a little, I wish I was a little more organized sometimes. But the one thing that I always want to do is I want to talk about the mind of the church, which is the mind of Christ, which we are supposed to be trying to acquire. That's the whole purpose of our life. And there's only one way to acquire this mind. Now, I talked to you about some of those ancillary things that are necessary. You know, the reading of the Psalter, the prostrations, and, and praying for those that you love, those that you don't love. Coming to the search services, confession. All of these things are ancillary things. They're very critically important. They're the foundation. But then what do we build on the foundation? We build love upon the foundation because God is love. We even love them when they're crying. So let's talk about this epistle sort of in more detail because this is it. This is all that matters. I uh, saw that in the first gospel, it was about St. Peter. Well, it was about the Lord's, the fish. St. Peter was involved in it. The catching of the fish. The first great catching of the fish. And what did St. Peter do when he saw the great catch of fish and the ships beginning to sink? He said, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. He didn't say that three and a half years later. What did he do three and a half days, days, years later when there was a great catch of fish? He jumped out of the boat and swam to the Lord as quickly as he could. Because in those three and a half years, he had learned about love. Now, he still had deficits only three days before that, or m more than that. Um, only a few, few days before that, though, Peter had, maybe 12 days before that, Peter had denied the Lord. But because he had lived according to the Lord's way of life, he'd learned to love. He'd learned to sacrifice of himself. When he saw the Lord at the seashore, all he wanted to do was be by the Lord. That's the kind of change that comes over us from recognizing we are sinful and we don't deserve God's love to still recognizing we're sinful and don't deserve his love, but having this great attachment, this great intimacy with God. That's what you should be trying to form in your life. That's all that really, really matters. He's almost at the terrible twos, but he's really smart, so he's a little precocious. So St. John says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been 
perfected in us. We have to read things carefully. Perfected in us. That's the whole purpose of your life, is to have God's love perfected in you. So it stands to reason, if you do something that's according to the love of God, then you are perfecting the love of God, or God is perfecting that love in you. And you are becoming what you are supposed to be. If you do anything else, then that love is not being formed, or maybe it's even being broken down. That's all that matters. That's how you measure everything. Do you, you do everything because of love. Now, we have commitments, and we have responsibilities. We have promises we have made. We have people that are depending on us. Of course, we should do everything that is necessary. But all of it has to be done because of love. And if you have two things to do, or two responsibilities, and one is because of love and the other is because of your own desires or because of your own ambition, you should always pick the one because of love. Now, if you have time to do something according to your own desires and ambition, it's not forbidden. But it's always forbidden to put your desires and ambition ahead of someone else. Because that's not what our Lord Jesus Christ did. So this is the whole purpose of life, is to learn to love. And in the catechesis that I do every Sunday, you know, usually, you know, you ask some questions and usually, uh, and I answer them and, and I think I'm going to cover a subject and I don't come anywhere close. But what I have covered and what really matters is you have to learn to love. You have to learn to have the mind of Christ. You learn to have to evaluate things in a spiritual way. That's all that matters in life. Now, perhaps you're going to memorize the Psalter. Perhaps you're going to have three-hour rule of prayer in the morning and a six-hour rule of prayer in the evening. Or perhaps you're just going to say some prayers and maybe not always pray as much as you think you should. And you're going to have all these books on your uh, bookshelf. And you think, you know, I haven't read that one. I've read half of that one, a third of that one, etc. When you move, you know, you kind of go, oh, okay. Um, some of these books I haven't read very much of. Maybe that's going to happen to you. But the most important thing that you must do is love. That's it. The reason you must love is because God is love. And, and God's love is perfected in you. Which means you're perfected. And the purpose of your life is fulfilled, which is to know God. You can't know love without loving. It's just not possible. I'm sure we've all experienced that. I've especially experienced that when I've seen people that have undergone abuse or something, of that, uh, something else, especially in prison and elsewhere, every, everywhere. People don't know how to react to love because they haven't been loved. So they don't know how to love. So it, it's, it's a mystery to them. Off, most of the time, people don't know that. They live according to a certain way, and they don't even know they're living according to that way. They don't know that they're living in a self-centered way. That's one of the reasons why I tell you, read the Gospels. If you read the Gospels over and over and again, you will see that there is a self-centered way and there's a way according to the Spirit, according to God. And you'll see those things contrasted all the time. And somehow, by the grace of God, you will learn... The, the right way to live. You will learn that way of life that is according to love. And if it's according to love, then it's according to courage, too. Those people who are fearful don't love. Perfect love casts out fear. Well, imperfect love or lack of love, and people are fearful. Our whole world is full of fear. I've talked about that a lot ever since the pandemic and before. So much fear. It's because people don't have love. And you don't have love, and I don't have love. Now, maybe we have a little bit. Glory be to God for that. But we don't have enough, and we should push ourselves to love our brother. That's why I tell you to do prostrations, and that's why I tell you to pray for your enemies. Because I do it. And the reason I do it is because it's according to love. And if I were perfect, then I wouldn't have to force myself to pray for this person or that person, because I wouldn't have any issues with anybody. I wouldn't be mad about anything. Nothing would bother me. I would just pray for the whole world. There was a monk somewhere on Manathos, just very holy, very simple. I think he was illiterate. And he kind of made a deal with God. And he said, well, Lord, I will just pray the prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, but I mean it for the whole world. <laughs> so he did. And there is this custom among, I think, people that are of better stature than, than we are, that you can pray that prayer. And when you say, Lord, have mercy, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, you're really praying for the whole world. Well, me, when I hear the word me, I think me. So I actually prefer, prefer to pray for you by name when I pray the Jesus prayer. Or sometimes 
for the world or for all those who are troubled or for all those who are abused or all those who are sad or all those who are suicidal, things like that. But if I were perfect, I could just say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me and say it, you know, 30,000 times in a day and be at peace and be all fire. As one of the Desert Fathers once said, we can be all fire and you should be all fire because God is fire. God is a consuming fire, the kind of fire that consumes all the sin and the only thing left is God. So we have to learn to love and we have to know that everything that you do every day is to be perfected in love. If you're doing something that doesn't perfect you in love, it's not the right thing to be doing. Now by no means am I saying anything that you should take home and say, well, you know, Father Seraphim said I should do things uh, I should love. Well, that means, you know, cutting the grass is not love or, or doing the dishes, that's not love. Well, ask your wife if doing the dishes is love. She'll probably tell you it is. And cutting the grass is love too. And taking care of things is love. And giving people a phone call is love. And giving people a ride somewhere is love. Whatever. All of that is love. If it's done with the motivation of love. This is the way to live. This is the most powerful way to live. I don't care if you got sins. I remember there's a, he's in Romania now. He's a probably, probably a hiram monk. His name was um, Adrian. He was in our church for some period of time. And uh, I would say, don't be afraid of sin. Be afraid of not repenting from sin. And he didn't like that. He said, no, Father, you should tell people to be afraid of sin. Well, I'm doubling down. Don't be afraid of sin. Be afraid of not repenting of sin. Don't be afraid of sin. Be afraid of not loving. Because if you love, it conquers everything. Now, I'm not telling you that you should say, oh, that sin's no big deal. No, a person who loves doesn't say that. A person who loves God con is concerned about everything, every detail. But not in a sort of a obsessive, compulsive way. We should be concerned with having the love of God flow through us to others. And then we are being perfected. Now, all of your problems, all of them, are because you don't love enough. Every single one of them. Because if we love, then God is perfected in our, uh, our, the perfect, uh, our love is perfected by God in our heart. There's only God. And if there's only God, there is no sadness. There is no suffering. Now, there might be physical suffering. There might be financial and etc. I'm not saying that we don't have those things happen, but those are just human stuff. And that's all going to go away. But the real suffering that a person has in their heart is when there's this, some pieces missing. You know about that. Every single one of us knows about that. When there's stuff missing in your heart, when there's a, the dark feeling you have, the, the feeling of being at loose ends, that angry feeling or, the, or the jealous feeling or a lustful feeling and all that stuff that's in your heart, all that garbage that's in there. That's the greatest suffering. A person could be in prison with their feet in stocks, but if they have the love of God in their heart, they are at peace. Their feet hurt, but they are at peace. This is what we should be pursuing. So everything you do in life should be based upon this. Now, I try to do it. I don't succeed very well, but I try to do it, and I try to teach it because it's the only thing that matters. Because God is love, and we are to become like God. Let's drill down a little bit and see how, how he speaks about these things. You should read the epistle of John, the first epistle. Second and the third, they're okay. I mean, they're fine, but um, I'm sorry, that's just my opinion. Uh, they're great. I mean, they're scripture, but come on, the first epistle of John, it is golden. Every word in it is, is like a, a pearl, a golden pearl, I guess. It's beautiful. So you should read it a dozen times a year. Maybe we should read it every month. What do you think? If we read the epistle of John, first epistle of John, every month, that's like 30 minutes of your life every month. Be well, time well spent. Or if you read slowly, maybe an hour. So he says, I repeat, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. And by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Now, he's speaking of something that maybe most of us don't even understand. By this, we know that he's given us of his spirit. Do you see his spirit? Do you feel his spirit? Well, you should. Maybe not see his spirit, but you should feel the love of God within you. And how do you know that? 
You'll know the love of God within you if you love. If you live in a way that's not self-centered, but is, is outward to other people, where you give of yourself, then you have this earnest of the Holy Spirit, this knowledge that God is within you, and that things really do matter, and that no, the li life is not purposeless. Life is full of purpose. The purpose is to become like God, to become love. So you have that earnest of the Holy Spirit because you're living according to that spirit. So he's saying something that is very advanced, actually. And most of us don't understand it. Or maybe we understand it with our head a little bit, like I explained it. But we can understand it with our hearts if we struggle to love. Regardless of whatever sins you got, whether you say a complete prayer rule or not, etc., etc. If you learn to love. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Now this is in the context that we have his love perfected in us. So if we are confessing that Jesus is the Son of God, we are confessing everything about him. We are confessing that, that his way of life is the only way of life. Everything else is death. We want to be like him. To confess Jesus as the Son of God is to want to be like Him, to want to emulate Him, to follow Him, not just to know things about Him and to say, well, you know, I can tell you why Arianism is wrong. It's, here it is, right in the Creed, all that stuff. It's important stuff, but it's only important if in confessing the truths about God, the dogmatic truths about God, we're living according to those dogmatic truths. So we're living according to him being the son of God. He came down to earth in order to heal us of our infirmities. And our great infirmity is that darkness of heart. Everybody should feel it. I've known people that I don't think feel darkness of heart. And I weep for them. I hope you're not among those people. You should know that your heart has darkness in it. But it can become light. A person who doesn't know about darkness in the heart it doesn't become light. So that's why I love our prayers so much, and I talk about this a lot. Our prayers talk about darkness, but then they talk about light. They talk about our sin, but then they talk about not just forgiveness, but, but healing from sin. So he goes on and says, and we have known and believed that the love, excuse me, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. When St. John says he knows something, that means he really knows it. And why does he know it? Because he lived according to love. How many things do you know? How many things do you really know for sure? You know them only if you've lived them. So when he says we have known, it means we have lived according to that which we say we know. And believe that the love, the love of God that the love that God has for us. The love that God has for us is uncountable, immeasurable, cannot be imagined, cannot be understood. It is bigger than anything that you can conceive of, the love of God. I remember once hearing about some elder, and this is the thing about Orthodox stories. You hear a story and you don't know where it comes from. Maybe you take three or four stories and add them together accidentally, but it's still true, it's still true. Because, because this elder uh, was confessing someone, and this person had a lot of problems in their life, a lot of sins. And the elder showed by the first two or three words that he said to him that he knew everything. <laughs> he knew everything. And he felt like unworthy but loved, because the elder loved him. Even though he knew everything about him, including some very deep, dark secrets. He knew everything, but he loved him anyway. And the love was so powerful that it really cleansed this person and gave them the impetus they needed to actually stop doing these sins. Because someone believed in him. Somebody loved him even though he had all these dark sins. He didn't need to hide his sins from anybody. In fact, he couldn't even hide his sins from anybody. He couldn't even hide his sins if he tried because the elder knew them without even him speaking. And yet he loved him. And that love consumed him. That love just completely surrounded him. Uh, shall we say as a, as a babe in the womb, perhaps. Or a babe... Uh, uh, at his mother's breast, feeling completely content and safe. 
And that is the love of God. The love of God completely surrounds us and is beyond anything we can anticipate. And we should struggle to have that love of God. Now, even though we don't know exactly what it is, we know aspects of the love of God, we can learn to live with love. And then we are being perfected. And eventually you'll know the love of God perfectly. In this day and age, in the temporal life, it's hard to know the love of God completely. I think St. John did. I think St. Seraphim did. A few other saints did. But most people, even ones we call saints, still had things to learn when they died. That's the way it's going to be with us. Because we're all just pluggers. But God's going to help us. So, he goes on to say, love has been perfected among us in this. Now he's giving the evidence now that your love is perfected. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so we are in the world. You should take that as an instruction manual right there. First of all, he's telling you what it's going to be like in the next life. We're not there yet. We still have fear. We have still have fear of death, fear of sickness, fear of persecution, fear of fear, all kinds of fears. And if you abide in God, God is love and there is no fear in, in love. And God's love is perfected in us. And what happens if you're having love perfected? We have boldness in the day of judgment. So that's what's going to happen. Then he tells us how to make it happen. Because as he is, so are we in this world. That is the instruction manual. That's the one thing you need to know. If that was on a slip of paper and was put into a bottle and came to some deserted island where someone had none, not known anything about Christ, if he read that and followed it, he would be saved. As he is, so are we in this world. So we see how the Lord was in the world and is in the world. We know that God is love. We know that God is purity and, and knowledge and wisdom and all these things. So we are to try to be those things. And perhaps you say, well, I, I can't figure that out. Well, no, you can't, but God can. So as he is, so are we. That's the way to live. That's the Christian life. When I was first learning about orthodoxy, I got some books, you know, and uh, this is when I was inquiring about orthodoxy. I got a book from someone that will remain nameless, very famous theologian, and I read it, and I thought, this th sounds just like my Roman Catholic catechism. Now, it was different words and dressed up in different ways, but it was just, it was dead to me. It was dead to me because it was stuff you have to do and stuff you should think, and, you know, we have these things that we believe and these things we don't believe and all this stuff. And he didn't talk about what I'm talking about now. Really, you could write a book. It could be one page, you know? And you could, if, if it was a thousand dollars, it would be worth it. And it would be, as he is, so are we in the world. That's the way to live. To struggle to be like God. And he will help you to be like him because he knows how he is. He knows how to help you be like he is. This is the purpose of your life. This is everything. So we all got stuff going on every day. I have so many things I can't finish and so many pressures and so many of this and so many of that. And sometimes, you know, you get in the swamp and you forget what you were going to do because there's alligators and snakes in there. But really, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to clean up the swamp inside your heart. And because, as you're cleaning up that swamp in your heart, well, what are you doing? You're loving others. And you're doing the best you can. And when you can't do something in a physical way, then you're, you're certainly praying for them every day and doing prostrations for them. This is your calling card. As he is, so are we in the world. That is what it means to be a Christian. You know, I have this thing where I kind of have all these uh, ways that we can describe salvation. You know, my favorite one is John 17, 3. And this is eternal life that we may know him, uh, that we you know, know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, right? Now I just forgot it. And this is eternal life that we may know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And 
Just imagine St. John Chrysostom did all of this without any notes. And he, he, he quoted thousands upon thousands of scriptures, and there's only a couple mistakes. I make a mistake every day. So this is the way of life. This is another way of life. This is another way that to describe salvation, to try to be like God. What a privilege it is to be like God. The one who created the universe, the one who is perfect and holy, knows all things, has no sin, is all-powerful against sin. We're trying to be like him. Is that ostentatious? I mean, it would be ostentatious for me to try to be like, I don't know, some great basketball player because I can't jump very high. But it's not ostentatious to try to be like God who made everything because he wants you to do that. So this is salvation, to struggle to be like God, to be as he is. And remember that as God is, is how he always was. Now we change, we go back and forth with the wind and with the waves. But God is, that's all, he is. That's how love is. Could you imagine, just for a moment, let's just try to for a second. To have such love within us that we're not changed in our demeanor towards somebody, no matter whether they curse at us or whether they praise us, whether they do good to us or do, do, good, do, good, uh, do evil to us, that our demeanor doesn't change, that we just love. Well, God is, and that's how he loves us, without change. Now, he might discipline us and other such things, but his demeanor to us never changes. By the way, the West didn't understand that. Probably the greatest heresy of the West is that somehow God did something with his son so that he would change his demeanor towards us. What a terrible blasphemy that somehow God would reconcile himself to us. God doesn't need to be reconciled to us. God has never been unreconciled. God is and he loves. We need to be reconciled to God. And that's what happened on the cross. And that's what happened in Jesus' life. And that's what happens in your daily life. To be more reconciled to God by changing to become like him. So just imagine to be loving someone without change. Which person do you do that to? To your, to your wife? To your husband? To your children? Well, none of them, right? Because there's times when you're really mad at your child or mad at your husband. When you have a bad thought. When you say, I, I really don't like the way you're talking to me right now. Imagine if your love completely is the same all the time. That is what we're aiming for. And don't think that's too high. That's what we're going to get there. We're going to get to that point. Little bit by little bit. With loving and then hating. And loving and then not liking. And praying for somebody and then forgetting to pray for them. And then being mad because somebody just messes with us. And um, another time they mess with us and we just forgive them without effort. This is the way of life in this world. But in the next world, we will just be. Just love. That's it. So he goes on to say, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. There's no fear in love. So we fear, we don't love. And then he ends, or at least this selection ends, with we love him because he first loved us. So that's how you cause people to love, by the way. You love them. That's how you cause people to change. You love them. Even the nasty ones. Even the ones that don't listen to you. Even the ones that they don't seem to get it at all. You just love them. God loves them perfectly. Doesn't matter what they do, what they don't do. Doesn't matter if they blaspheme God or they love God. If they tell lies or truth. If they're kind or cruel. God loves them the same. So if we love them the same, we are like God. So that's your marching orders. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and then our neighbor as ourselves. And we love him because he loved us. So let's go ahead. Let's be the grown-ups here. And let's go ahead and love people before they love us. Or as they hate us. Or as they malign us. Or as they hurt us. And if we do that, we'll get really good at doing it because God will help us. And we'll just love and if you just love, then there's just God. And if there's just God, then everything is just perfect and good and holy and peaceful. That's salvation. May God bless you and help you in all things. Amen.